welcome back to my channel. I'm Mel, I'm an Uruguayan neuroscientist. I'm doing a PhD in Germany, but on the side I have this YouTube channel in which I interview scientists all over the world. And today's guest is Dr. Samuel Katz. He's from the United States, he's a PhD in immunology, but he works in an area called systems biology, and he has worked in a lot of things like gene regulation, immunology, neuroscience, and also bioinformatics. He's going to talk about a tool and an algorithm that he created to answer some of these questions. And these are also the fields that are very interesting to me personally, so I'm very excited to have this guest. So hi Sam, it's very nice to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi Mel, I'm really excited we get to do this. to start, tell us a bit about your story. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and, and like every New Yorker, I assume everybody knows where that is. Uh, I grew up actually in a very religious community um, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, even though we were in New York, uh, we didn't really speak English, uh, and I didn't get a traditional education, so there was no science education or math or any of that. Uh, I later developed an interest in science on my own, I then taught myself a lot through libraries and different ways that I like snuck books in and discovered it. And later when I was 18, I took what we call in the States a GED, which is an equivalency degree for people who didn't go to high school. So if you pass that test, it kind of counts as if. And then I went to Stony Brook University in Long Island where I studied biochemistry. I got to do a fellowship at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor uh, working on why sometimes after a bone marrow transplant we get more infections. That was really exciting work. Um, and then after I finished my bachelor's, I got a Fulbright scholarship to go to Berlin in Germany and study, uh, do some research over there, which was an incredible experience. And then I came back to the States and then I did my PhD in immunology through the National Institutes of Health in the US, in Maryland and the University of Cambridge in the UK. So I got to split my time between those two places. So it's been a, a lot of moves and a lot of different departments, but a very exciting journey. Wow, what an interesting background. And then how did it happen that you fell in love with immunology? So as I was going through my training, both in my bachelor's degree and the different rotation and laboratories I was able to do, there were two things I became incredibly excited about, which was, one was the immune system because I had always thought of the brain as the one, as that machine within us that processes information and has to come up with responses. But our body is full of information processing uh, reactions and responses, and the immune system is one of the most complex ones we have. So I became very excited by the question of the immune system. And when I was in Berlin and I was working at the Berlin Institute for Medical Systems Biology, I was introduced to systems biology, the idea of we are no longer just studying, you know, what does this protein do or what does this particular gene mutation cause? You're saying, how do these things come together to work as a system? How do they together give us an immune system, an immune response? How do they come together to give us inflammation? Uh, how do they come together and give us autoimmune diseases? So I became very excited about systems biology and then I thought to myself, in the immune system would be an incredible thing to bring this kind of systems ideas thinking to, because our immune system has many individual components, but they come together to give us the immune responses we have. And they fail to come together. When there's a failure of the immune system, it's a failure of a systemic failure. So I'm really excited about how we can think of the immune system, not just as, you know, what does this cell do or what does this cell do or what does this protein do? But when we have this organization of cells, when we have this different proteins coming together, what result do we get that you wouldn't get of just one of them? Yes, systems biology, the best area. And tell us a bit more about what do you do? Because you also do bioinformatics, right? There have been two things that have been very exciting in my research that I got to be part of. Uh, 
The first is, you know, I've been studying the immune system and the immune system is made out of two parts, your innate immune system and your adaptive immune system. And the innate one is the one that is always there on the ready to respond for any danger it sees. And your adaptive one is the one that learns what the danger is and develops a way to eliminate it. That's the antibodies that a lot of people are familiar with. And each of them have benefits and trade-offs. Your innate immune system, the benefit is, it does need to learn or get trained or, or identify the danger. It can be deployed and respond right away. And you can see why it's important we have that part of our immune system. You can't always wait two weeks until you respond to something that's gone wrong. But on the other hand, since it's not precise and it doesn't learn how to recognize exactly what the danger is, it just causes damage all over the tissue or the cell or the part of the body it's responding. So the adaptive immune system is really good because it only targets the, the pathogen the, or the danger or the issue at hand and doesn't attack the rest of the tissue. So if you think of your immune system, you're always balancing between having something that can respond really fast, but doesn't cause too much damage to something that can take its time, but then be really precise. And a lot of the diseases of the immune system, especially of the inflammation, is when that response that happens fast either happens too easily or lasts too long. And by using the ways that we've studied and studying, well, how does your body switch it on and off so fast? Is people have usually thought that, you know, it just turns on those genes really quickly and then turns them off. And what we found was that even if those genes are turned on, your cells can choose to process those genes that are being active in different ways to turn on and off inflammation. So you have this very sensitive switch that can say, we need to respond to some danger or like we need to stop because we're causing a lot of inflammation in this tissue and we need to cut it off. And that gives us insights in so many diseases where the issue isn't always that a gene is missing or a gene is mutated, but just the cell signals are just processing these genes in a different ways. So that's a very different way of thinking about how your body turns things on and off. And as a bonus, as I was solving it, and that's such a great thing about science, I was developing these algorithms for how to pick out the parts that are important, I realized that you can use this algorithm for all other problems in science because the algorithm holds true when you look at what happens together in other diseases, how can we use it for the disease I'm studying. And that same algorithm that I developed, which I called signal because it looks for the signal and the noise, ended up being used by a bunch of other scientists studying things as liver disease, schizophrenia, in response to infectious diseases and all kinds of different analyses for something that I built to study the immune system. And that's just really exciting about biology and systems biology, that we're all trying to think in similar ways and solve different problems. And there's just different specifics of how your body does it in different contexts. Wow, that's really nice. I will put the link below in the description if anyone wants to check out your tool. And I can also say that, yes, if you are studying one disease, for example, when I was studying certain neurological and psychiatrical diseases, the immune system was always showing up. Or like the top genes that you will see, they will be immune related. And you always run into this issue of having people that they say, you know, oh, uh, since I'm a neuroscientist, I don't know this and um, that gene so they don't know what to do with these results but the same for all the areas obviously so for example now that we are talking about COVID-19 so immune system viruses but still neuroscience shows up so lots of taste and smell and some other neurological and psychiatrical uh, symptoms or side effects. So there's a big crosstalk in between all of these and that's why I really really think this area is the best and to be able to specialize or get trained in all these different things is really cool. Plus bioinformatics is a fantastic tool for this. I also want to ask you if you could give us an opinion about the importance of developing this kind of stuff that there's people like you that are working on these things. You know as as an immunologist, it's been a privilege to have this information as all of us in the world have been going through uh, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And to be able to have some insights and to make clear some things to other people. And 
one of the things that I've been able to now communicate to people, and as we're understanding COVID-19 more, in those people where COVID-19 disease uh, ends up being a very severe disease, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, one thing that goes wrong, but their whole way of their immune system responding is different than the way it, it is in other cases. So usually when we first see a danger, we respond with inflammation and then your, our antibodies take over and then the inflammation can subside. And in COVID-19 patients who have the severe disease, that balance of using inflammation to control it at the beginning and then switching over into the more precise antibody response doesn't happen properly. So thinking of our immune system as a system, thinking of our body as a system is incredibly important because so many things that go wrong isn't because just one thing went wrong or, you know, somebody was born with this one thing that is different. Often is things are just coming together in different ways. So we are now at a really exciting time in biology where we can ask those questions. And especially in the immune system, we need to think about how does, for example, the person's energy resource, how they metabolize energy and how much energy they have available to make an immune response. How does that affect the immune system response they are having? What about stress levels? How is that affecting an immune system response? So if you think of it as in a systems biology way, we can get to so many more insights that are much more closer to the human experience of interacting with the dangers of the world and different than just, you know, a cell in a test tube. So that's really exciting. And it'll just become more and more, as we have better technologies and better insights, we'll be able to diagnose and hopefully treat and solve, not just diseases where you have, you know, say a depletion in insulin or something, but then ask why is a system, does it not produce it? And how can we build that system in a way that it can uh, overcome this disease? So that will be something really exciting. And I think there's a whole new world of, of biology and thinking about cures and thinking about prevention and treatment that we haven't even tapped on because we're only just coming up of, you know, solving things on the small individual level. But once we start thinking of systems, there's a whole new world of problems we understand better, which lead hopefully to solutions. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, as Carl Sagan said, we are only in the shore. So there's a whole ocean to explore. It's super, super cool. I also want to use this opportunity to ask you, since you already have your PhD, you have had a certain, you know, trajectory in your scientific career. Do you have any piece of advice to younger researchers, to students, someone maybe from the same background as you or, or not? So do you have any piece of advice, tips, comments? Thank you for bringing that up. Uh... Like everyone in science, uh, it was a journey for me and different uh, stops and self-doubt and times when I thought uh, I was going to drop out of it. Uh, for those who, you know, grew up like me in a non-traditional education system or maybe didn't get an education at all, um, the thing I always tell people of that background is the great thing of our era is you can learn everything by yourself online. The only thing you can't learn is passion. That comes from you. And if you have that passion, everything else you can teach yourself. So I would encourage people who were in my shoes where I was when I started, uh, don't think of yourself as behind or lesser as you enter the scientific world. Every scientist I know encounters a problem that they've never learned how to solve and goes on the internet and watches YouTube videos and Googles how to solve it. Uh, no shame in learning. The biggest thing is to just care and be excited about it. And if you have that, you have what it takes to be in science. Because that is the thing that science will demand of you most, which is grit passion and just caring uh, so don't get lost in the question of well what do you know oh my god you don't know about this cell type or you've never heard of this we'll google it you'll be fine yes that's really really good advice 
Those are all the questions I have for you today. So thank you so much, Sam, for being here with us. It was a pleasure talking to you and good luck out there doing all this cool stuff that you're doing. And I look forward to running to you in some systems biology or systems medicine conference, hopefully when all this is possible again. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so excited I got to talk about all these things and about you know the work you're doing for it to reach people. So I think it's incredible. And also, I just want to say, uh, after the, the Holocaust, my great grandparents and my grandparents who were born then uh, were traveling around looking for new places to live. They were originally from Romania and Hungary. And they then stopped in Uruguay and my grandfather spent most of his childhood and his teenage years uh, in Uruguay and always had a very strong connection to it before he came to the US. So if he was alive now, uh, he'd be very excited that I got to speak to an Uruguayan scientist. So that's been an extra bonus um, and was really exciting. So thank you. Oh, that's so nice. I I'm not used to this. So it's very cool that you bring us this little Easter egg at the end. And uh, well, thank all of you for your attention. If you like the video, I invite you to subscribe to the channel, to give thumbs up if you like it, leave a supporting comment if you are willing to support financially, there's also a Patreon account and with these resources, basically I'm working with people in Latin American countries to create more content, edit videos, so I can upload more videos faster and better quality, etc. and also generate jobs there. So yeah, check out the channel. There's probably some other video that you might like and see you in the next one. Bye bye.